Recording. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Mary Beth Carter of the Seminar Committee for the International Association of Jungian Studies. And today our speaker is Paul Atanello. He is giving a talk on AIDS and COVID in the world and acknowledging that today is World AIDS Day. Uh, Paul is a Jungian analyst in private practice and a senior lecturer at Newcastle University who has taught at the University of Hong Kong and as a guest professor at UCLA. He received his PhD from UCLA and a diploma as an analyst from the C.G. Young Institute in Zurich. He has lived and worked on four continents, has been involved in creative and academic projects, HIV programs, and is co-founder of the Psychosocial Wednesdays seminar series. He has published in essay collections, journals, and reference works, including the groundbreaking Queering the Pitch, the New Lesbian and Gay Musicology, Writing on Contemporary Musics, the Culture of AIDS, and Philosophical and Psychological Topics. So we're really glad to have you here today, Paul, and we'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Um... I notice at one level uh, a tendency for me to dither slightly. Um, I've been thinking about these things for a long time. I've been thinking about them a lot lately, and I haven't finished the book. So I know that whenever I talk about any of these topics, as even happened today on the listserv, I'm thinking of so many things at once. So do feel free to ask questions or interrupt or even sort of go, can you explain that, please, because we get it. Right. Um, I'm a university lecturer. I'm perfectly accustomed to being interrupted, so it's not a problem for me. Um, so some of what I did the other day, I was, I was, I've got this idea of my approach to cultural complexes, which I'll show you. And I was running through some of the darker aspects of AIDS. I wanted to sort of finish that and move to some aspects that go in other directions. So today's not quite as dark, but there's, well, you know how much weight the topic carries. So let's see how it goes. Let me move to the PowerPoint. So, Um, I already said the cultural complex, just to repeat, I'm thinking in terms of what do we all face when we face HIV and AIDS. You know, there were some exchanges today on the list about why would I do cultural complexes? What are the problems with them? But one of the simple aspects is, you know, literature of psychology and AIDS and a lot of the depth psychology literature endlessly has people facing patients, and particularly in the period uh, 1981, 82 to 1996, when things were much scarier, um, the analysts are surprised. The therapists are surprised. They're shocked. They're disoriented. They're overwhelmed. It's very, very common. So I was thinking, why wouldn't we try to sort of map out what are the normal complexes that are associated with this? So people were just a bit more prepared, could look at it objectively rather than in individual terms, right? Because there are things that are so heavily shared among so many people. So projections and complexes, charged feelings and images, what appears again and again. And I am treating a cultural complex as something that is. So I'm not really looking at individual cases. And um, I'm, I'm very much a sort of intuitive type, and I tend to be very linguistically oriented. Uh, my sister's actually a painter, but I'm not very good at drawing. But my rather clumsy imagination with visual things, I do keep imagining, what if you had a map of projections and complexes around AIDS? It would be so interesting to draw that, especially if you could make it fluid, because this is a moving set of targets. They change relationship from moment to moment. So it would be wonderful to be able to sort of graph it out somehow. Beyond my abilities, I think, but if you can if you can sort of imagine what I'm trying to imagine in that. 
And as I said last time, a lot of what I'm looking at with HIV and AIDS, these are some of the major uh, cultural complexes. The entire cluster around fear and anger, the emotions of who gave it to you, terror and anxiety, which goes all the way out to psychosis. And then the worlds of infection and taint, which of course have come back again with COVID. Um, our entire world of dis revulsion, disgust, the virus illness is proof of some kind of life that you've been leading. And something that I point out that I think is really important that this is important again under COVID that, you know, infection is something we know scientifically and we're all, you know, well-educated people who have had uh, also parents sort of smack our hands when we try to pick up something off the ground. And, uh, but infection is invisible. And I think we have to respect that it's kind of a trained in cultural complex and that we need to sort of, it's hard to know exactly what to say to people who didn't believe in the eighties and nineties that HIV AIDS was actually caused by a microorganism and to people who now don't believe anything they're told about COVID. It's hard to speak to that, but at least if we could be aware that it's understandable, especially with people who are more sensate, more imminent, that they would go, well, how do I know anything you're telling me is true? It's difficult. That world of sickness and rot that I talked about last time, which is very much the body with AIDS, stigmata and philoctetes and inana and all the death scenes from some of the movies. And then the difficult world of death and nothingness. Um, death in a lot of AIDS materials work, HIV work, isn't really, there aren't a lot of heavens. And if there are heavens, they're somehow damaged. That's not just the gay community either. It shows up in um, things, various sort of novels and movies and images and paintings by people across the world uh, associated with AIDS. So there's something strange about what do we do with death? And it does seem to have a certain quality of nothingness in the black hole, which is strange because of course, death is the whole reason that HIV is frightening, right? It is endlessly about death, but people tend not to talk about it. They talk about everything that comes up to it, which is really interesting. That's a bit different than uh, some other some other illnesses, some other things in the past. And something that became very important for me personally that I'm beginning to think is really, no, I am thinking, is really core to the entire HIV AIDS discussion, the passionate body. There's something about AIDS which is associated with the body that really wants to live in a number of ways, right? So that, those are things I said last time, but I wanted to just come back to them. So here's an almost too famous example, but I'll show it to you anyway, with your permission. Um, this is the scene in heaven from Angels in America. And it's interesting because even though it's one of the biggest and most famous versions, like a lot of these heavens associated with AIDS, it's complicated, it's uncomfortable. Um, you know, this particular heaven is supposed to look like San Francisco after the earthquake. It's a beautiful place, but it's very damaged. And the angels are somewhat helpless and disoriented because God has left, right? God has left heaven, which is one of the reasons that AIDS exists. And we'll see the angels who are themselves bundled up in rather um, heavy clothing because it's cold and it's winter and there's apparently no heating. They're somewhere in the Palace of Fine Arts, but it looks as though it's been kind of bombed out. And they're shifting papers, trying to manage the world, manage the universe, but it's not quite working. And they're frightened. So they want to talk to Pryor, the man in the play who is uh, HIV positive, because they've told him they want him to go down to Earth and prophesy what, will, what AIDS will mean, what it will be about, and he refuses. It's an amazing scene. So something about this entire problem that death and heaven are so important around AIDS, but they're so 
Well, they're never very clear. It's a very beautiful scene. So, I know it's cheating to show such a large chunk of such a beautifully constructed artistic work. Um, it's like, what point am I really allowed to make from that? Um, for me, this has always been fairly central to a lot of the way I do think about AIDS. It is, of course, uh, Tony Kushner's creation for Angels in America, and it's not quite like anything else. But for me, it does sort of connect a lot of the instability of heavens, a lot of the anxiety that at some points, of course, you can treat this completely uh, culturally, especially in relation to gay men, that they felt uh, disincluded in religion in the 80s and 90s. There are a lot of patterns related to that. It's easy to see them, um, a lot of examples of that. But as I say, even with the many, many people with HIV who are not gay men, um, which is actually most of them, if you, if you know that, um, there are these recurrent patterns of heaven is uncertain, heaven is unstable, we're not quite sure what it means. Um, even in uh, small town Africa, even though there are much more traditional approaches to, um, to religion, of course, since across a great deal of Africa, still to this day, we're constantly told that regular churches will often not allow people with AIDS in. So there tend to be special churches that tend to be created by people outside the main rank of, uh, of church organizations. So there's a sense of still, even 40 years after the starts of being excluded somehow and having to find a different relationship to eternity. So another aspect that I was looking at that I want to briefly outline is the problem of the therapist facing the patient. Um, some of this is about, I did make sort of, I, I have looked carefully for depth psychology, publications around depth psychology and HIV AIDS from the 80s and 90s and even to today. There actually aren't very many. Um, a reader once complained to me that he thought there was a lot written about AIDS, and actually there is. If you look at the uh, APAs, the APA actually has bibliographies of writing about HIV, which are now in three volumes with about 8,000 articles in there and other publications. Um, I do have copies of uh, copies of those, the bibliographies, not the articles, of course, though many of them can be found online. And of course, the truth is when people publish in psychology, it will often go to territory that we regard as uh, the province of depth psychology. But people actually publishing as Jungians or Freudians or any of a variety of other psychoanalytic fields, there isn't that much. So um, there is a recurring pattern in a lot of them that, uh, well, as I say, an important thing is that very often the analyst or therapist is not ready for the intensity of what the patient is facing. And sometimes in the literature in the 80s and 90s, that went actually rather badly. Um, some of the more famous things here, uh, just a couple of things to mention. Robert Bosnack wrote um, what I think is the only book length uh, study of an analysis around AIDS. Um, there are a couple of other things that are parallel. There's a recent book by a Freudian in New York who's writing about his own experience of uh, studying to become a Freudian analyst in New York. Uh, while being HIV positive, which is really interesting. He's really terrifically smart. Um, but of course, it was after 2000, at a point when the medications exist and the whole topic is kind of milder, right? So Bosnak, this was, he's writing about an analysis in 1984 to 1989. 
smack in the middle of an incredible amount of darkness. And his analysand, a southern young man who wants to join the priesthood and doesn't want to talk about being gay, uh, by uh, about three months into their analysis, he falls ill and then he's diagnosed with AIDS. And it is 84, and so he will last a couple of years, that's all. And Bosnak is, it's really amazing. Bosnak does an amazing job. Bosnak's still young at that point. He's very honest about it. He really looks at it. He really tries to open some space for the analysis and to really pay attention to what's happening with him. And there's a sense that, well, sort of toward the climax of the book, the analysis and um, Christopher actually dreams of death for the first time and seems to be facing the fact he's already quite ill. I mean, this is unavoidable at this point. He's facing the fact that something is really happening and he can't just pretend it isn't happening. And what's interesting about it, I think it's okay to say this. It seems pretty clear in the book. Bosnak is actually dealing with revulsion and fear and sadness around death and he does it really bravely, and he gets very far with it. Even though Christopher, the analysis man, doesn't want to think about things, in his last days, he's able to sort of, as it were, piggyback his individuation on Bosnak's, right? Bosnak has gone further, paid more attention, is more ready for the ideas of illness and death and their intimacy with each other. And the analysis in his last days gets a lot of comfort for that and seems to follow him. It becomes a bit of a, I guess, a Virgil and Dante kind of relationship. And it's very interesting how, yeah, I, I, I know this happens in other cases, but it's interesting that under these circumstances, the analyst can go somewhere and have a space for the analysis to follow. Another case by Sachiko Rees, um, this is from when she was young. Um, she's written about a 1990 case with, it, she was doing sand play with a very polite Japanese American man and she's Japanese American. So she writes about being Japanese American as something that will get them both into a bit of trouble. She's young, he's shy. And over the period of time, for instance, at one point, he asks her about sand play. And she says, well, I was waiting for you to be ready for it. And he laughs and says, I've wasted my time. And as they get into sand play, which they'll do for about eight months, they don't have longer than that he will start to say certain things do seem to reflect the fact that he's dying and she doesn't want to hear it. She will actually stop him. And only later in the analysis will she admit, you know, it is possible that he's dying. She doesn't want to face it herself. She was very brave in writing about this. It's quite beautiful, but it's painful. As a young analyst, she doesn't want to hear it. She's terrified of his death, of his illness. And he does die without being able to talk to her much about it. And there's something about that's another justification for talking about all of these uh, cultural complexes and the really severe things around AIDS. I, I realize we all have different skills. And even though we have basic training, we do different things with, with analysis and we have different talents. I know that um, one of my friends here in town is a rather brilliant Kleine and a very sweet guy who uh, uh, we're talking about uh, having a group for gay men because uh, he wants to arrange that. So we're going to manage it together. He deals with abused children, which he's been doing in the NHS for about a decade. And he finally realized he couldn't handle it on a daily basis anymore. Uh, separated himself out, has his own practice, and takes a few rather severe cases. And at one point, he did mention to me that one of the difficulties is, of course, they flirt with him, which is horrifying to even think about for me. And
And when he told me that, I said, I couldn't do what you do. It's unbearable. And he said, well, I couldn't do what you do. This AIDS stuff, it's, it's how could you possibly deal with that? And we sort of agreed that we were both going in different directions. As it were, his work was more red. My work was more black. And I think we all do different versions of that. I do understand it. But I still think in identifying some of these cultural complexes, in training, we need to be aware that they exist. Even young analysts need to be aware that it is possible that they'll be looking at death with an analysand. And they need to be a bit more ready for it than a lot of people are. So a little bit on AIDS and COVID. Of course, they're completely different. But, and I'm still struggling with this because I know that last year I was thinking, ah, look at all the similarities. And a lot of people in the HIV support groups that I work with, there are three of them here in Newcastle. And I'm, I sort of run one. I'm a member of a second and I'm associated with the third, excuse me. And when COVID showed up and all sorts of people were going, oh no, we can fall sick and die. It's terrible. This is unbearable. The government has to do something. Don't tell me what to do. I don't want to wear masks. And, and everyone in the HIV groups was sort of looking at each other going, well, this sounds familiar, right? <laughs> that everybody was just doing the same things again. And we were thinking, well, do these people know that they can, you know, I don't want them to assume that they will, but that they can fall ill and die. That's just a fact. They should realize that. And that was a discussion we kept having in those groups. Of course, HIV is a meta disease. It's this syndrome that allows for other diseases. So it's strange. It's hard to understand. It's more mysterious. People get sort of disoriented by how hard it is to understand. And of course, contracted through sexual contact or needles. And though it's weak, it can use those body fluids to be passed on. So it's at a relatively shocking level in Western culture, right? Now, COVID is just a cold or flu virus, which is one of the most familiar kinds of things there is. These are minor annoyances. They show up every year, except that this one is now transformed by this severity and the strangeness of it. Some cold and flu symptoms appear, others don't. And because we are privileged, we are safe, we forget all those times of plague, tuberculosis, cholera, even the Spanish flu, that's a century ago. And after decades of antibiotics and cleanliness, we still seem to think this shouldn't happen to us, right? It's a very, it's a very problematic relationship to it that we have. So they're both the different and the same. And of course, HIV and AIDS appeared most dramatically in problem populations, homosexuals and foreigners and drug users, uh, populations people didn't want to think about, where COVID shows up in everyone. Um, but it'll mostly uh, endanger older and more fragile people. So that I think that cultural impulse to protect the young doesn't have much of an impact. So it seems to be about us, but not me, as it were. You know, I teach in a university and it's possible that my point of view is a bit distorted. But when I've done these lectures for my students, I keep thinking most of them are fine, right? And actually a couple of them have had COVID and had a little trouble, um, had a little bit of a health impact, but not much, right? So it is something where they're not sort of imminently scared in the room which changes the tone, is a lot of our anxiety about death particularly aimed at the young. That would be kind of a family thing, kind of a parent thing, right? We do treat the young differently than we treat other parts of our culture. The whole world of death and mortality. We are safer than anyone in the history of the world, but so we forget we can die and we seem to still be doing a really clumsy job with that. I keep thinking about this in terms of all of these cultural structures. Um, this is an excerpt from, uh, you know that I'm a musicologist and I still tend to teach a lot of these things through music, though even with the uh, politics book, I keep using examples from literature and plays and uh, uh, political and public statements. But this is 
uh, by the Irish National Opera, and it is an excerpt of two young people in lockdown. Uh, it's the it is a mini opera. The whole thing is about twelve minutes long. This is the middle couple of segments, and there's a series of different sort of gestures, different segments. Where are we here? Come on. Surge. We must protect the dead man. 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 So rather beautifully done. Um, and there's uh, much of the uh, much of the popular music around COVID has also been kind of comic. And I do keep trying to figure out how do we relate to that. Perhaps it is because so much of it is by younger people. I, I don't know. It does. It raises questions, obviously, about what are cultural complexes, especially because I think I've tended for a long time to assume that um, 
AIDS is an immense basic, uh, sorry, pardon me, I'm saying this wrong. The fear of death is a very important basic structure in culture. And in some ways it's similar with AIDS and COVID, so why are they so different? Perhaps I'm trying too hard to make them the same when that's only at a very deep level. Um, as I say here, the fear of death is at the core of culture. I do like those ideas of Becker and Solomon and Greenberg and all um, talking about the way that is uh, that is deeply important to us. So perhaps that's what's similar. Now, I think I already said this last time, so I won't repeat the story, but when I began this thesis, I knew at the, at the uh, Jung Institute in Zurich, when the topic of a thesis came up, I knew that I would have to write about AIDS. I mean, what else is there that's the core to my life? Uh, then I went through a couple of years of not wanting to do it. And then I finally realized I can't, could do it, was thinking of it very differently in these cultural complexes, these sort of um, deeply connected things, connected to archetypes. And it was a surprise when I thought of this thing, the passionate body, and was encouraged to make it the title. And I do now think of AIDS increasingly as something that is deeply about a passionate body. Uh, what is it that keeps us alive? How do we relate to sexual bodies of others, to living bodies of others, to the dying bodies of others? And it will be connected to all sorts of creation, a lot of art, elaborate funeral ceremonies, quilts. And even I think you have to treat drugs as associated with this because drugs are about wanting to do something exciting, something beyond, right? We still distance them from a lot of our discussions because they're illegality, but they are about passion. They really are. So how do we do this, this passion for the living body, passion for sexuality, passion against death? And it was a shock, not only for the thesis, but in relation to my own life to consider myself, what if I am someone who is really defined by having been really passionate? Maybe that's my relation to AIDS. That, that was honestly a shock for me. So I think I'm still working with that. Um, let me give you one last example. I, as I say, I've been doing uh, sort of music about AIDS for a couple of decades. And um, there are many that are in videos. There are many that are recorded. A lot of them are, of course, sad or mournful, melancholy. There are changes in tone in the last couple of decades. This particular one is from the Congo. And uh, if I can overgeneralize a bit, like some of the other French speaking stuff, this is the, the French language Congo, but like some of the things coming out of Paris, it's sort of a bit more courageous than a lot of things in the English speaking world about combination of um, when things were bad and when things are good. And this is something that is, I don't know, it's a surprising video, but I think you'll understand it when you see it. Yeah. Que des histoires des gens vrais, loin des mythes et légendes. Assumer la voix haute avec courage. Tiens ma touille. Banana, banana, copy, la histoire, la bobo, il m'a laïe, aspect, 
of it and it is visceral right this is actually a picture from this famous uh broadway bears a an aids benefit that's been running since about 1984. it started with just some of the hoofers the chorus line from broadway musicals doing strip shows in some of the gay bars and it's developed into this huge chaotic erotic dionysian thing that goes on every year. Unfortunately, they don't uh, produce videos of it. There are excerpts on YouTube, but they're quite beautiful. And they'll have Broadway stars and other uh, theater stars as, uh, as leads in it, but it really features the chorus, right? Um, because if you've worked with dancers and singer dancers, you know that just not only the physical beauty, but the energy that comes off of them is just an amazing thing, right? And so as they've always been smack in the middle of the AIDS epidemic for them to do this, this is the really glorious passionate body. This is the really sort of great version. And they've built it into something that they've been, um, that they've been celebrating yearly for years. So thank you very much. I think that was a bit longer than I was allowed, but let me uh, come back for questions. Thank you, Paul. It's wonderful. I'm so moved. Hmm. Power of music is right. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. It is cheating, I suppose. But <laughs> I guess if we're looking at emotion, there's so much in these things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we do. We have about eight minutes for questions or comments. Hmm. Hmm. Anybody? Since it takes a moment. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I'll I'll chip in while 
<laughs> Others are thinking if that's all right, Paul. <laughs> Sorry. You can cope. Um, a double barreled question. The first bit is very, very quick. Have you seen the film? It's an old film, A Matter of Life and Death with David Niven. Um, I'm trying to it's remember. The, 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 the plot is, sorry, the reason that I, I mention it is because there's a scene in it that is so similar to the first scene that you showed. Right. And it's, it's, mm. it, what happens is that there's a pilot who crashes and he's meant to die. I have seen this, yes. But, it, but he doesn't die and he falls in love with somebody and then an angel goes and gets him and says, you were meant to die, you've got to come with me to heaven. And then there's right. a trial in heaven where he goes in, in front of a court and somebody acts on his behalf and, and, and pleads his case uh, for, for death. But and, and, and what it meant it made me think was, and, and but you actually said this later on because that when we're talking about the AIDS cultural complex, really what it is, it's the death cultural complex. It's linked to it, although it's yeah, a little, linked you know, it. it's a little yeah. right. It pulls Cause, it because the to themes the side. are same. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. The, the second part of the question is because you also mentioned about Japanese politeness and again link just linking it to death and this in some ways this turns on on the head are you familiar with the, the true story of the Japanese passenger plane that was shot down by the Russians in the 1980s I don't think I know um, what actually happened was that um, something went wrong with the setting of the satellite navigation on this Japanese plane when it took off and it was flying 400 miles to the north and it was flying over Russian airspace and another plane Japanese plane part of the same group saw what was happening so he's off course and the culture didn't allow him to challenge the decision he just contacted him and said is everything okay Hierarchy. and the, okay. All the, right. the pilot said yes everything's okay and he didn't dare say <laughs> you're off course because the you know something's coming you've made a mistake here because the culture didn't and what actually happened was that the russians shot the plane down and it just struck me that there's a, a case of culture actually overriding the you know the, the death uh, sure. fear of death instinct and and actually leading to the deaths of all the all the passengers on the uh, on, on 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 the plane though i think any culture is going to do some versions of that you know it's interesting to talk about japanese culture because it tends to be from our point of view, often formalized, codified, it's easy for us to see it do things because they tend to articulate them so clearly. But just think of, you know, there was another, there were some memoirs from World War I. What would typically be the ways that, say, uh, Brits would allow themselves to die in a situation? Probably if it looked more um supportive not those are the wrong words more noble think of the way that worked in a lot of situations in world war one and it looks different in different cultures but i think you know cultural complexes are strong and sometimes we can see them in a given named culture like being japanese or being british from outside but of course the hyper modern world is messier but that's okay because it's interesting to see how different countries, different people deal with COVID. But there is that sense that we have shared complexes. These aren't just individual people doing things. It's like everyone reacts sort of in large groups. Well, that's pretty obvious, but you get. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you brought in the clinical aspect and for a therapist to be reflecting on what is it we need to be learning and also growing within ourselves, right? In relation to working with people with HIV, AIDS and death in general, right? right. Yeah. And, you know, I had shared with you some of those articles from the San Francisco, San Francisco Young Journal where, um, some people, analysts had come together talking about their experience during the 80s and 90s. And I think that there, it was the first time just last year speaking up about what they went through and what they experienced. And there's been such silence 
you know, um, kind of which has been part of the complex, right, around our cultural complex towards HIV AIDS, right, where um, the silence and, like you said, leave it with it's just people, throwaway people, unfortunately, was the government view, at least in the US. Sure. So I'm just so glad that bringing this out about, you know, more attention and self reflection, you know, for us to take this time and talk about it. So I just appreciate it that you're giving voice to this, to this day. Well, I think I mentioned last week, one of the one of the tricks of talking about AIDS is it's been a part of my life for too long since I was 26 years old. And I talked about some odd things Verena Koss said to me, but still the truth is a big chunk of my life has been spent right in the middle of this. So can I look at it objectively from outside? Probably not. And when I say people should know about this, it's like, is my judgment accurate in this or is it distorted by being too much a part of me? But maybe training should always include a certain amount of, okay, so we won't give you patients in the most difficult situations, not, not psychic situations, not particular psychic conditions, but what about when you have patients who are dying or something terrible has happened to them? We need, it needs to be a part of your training that we at least talk about this. And perhaps they should be having some hospital experience of this, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's almost necessary. Um, I, was just th I was just thinking that uh, one of the uh, core feelings, or I don't know if it's an emotion, at the center of what might be the, the cultural death complex is the feeling of awe. The sort of the um and it's that might be part of what makes it very difficult to uh for people for for anyone but for an analyst to approach the idea of a patient dying there's a sense that there's not only the awe of the magnitude of what is about to happen but also there's a way in which that anyone who goes through that experience is in some ways sanctified and so that they're in some ways sort of almost the perhaps the analyst anticipates the person almost being promoted above them and so can't approach them um and i suppose that that's where a, a jungian perspective actually does come to the center because our whole shtick is about being able to approach the numinous um and um so uh, one of the things i was wondering about your, during your presentation was the kind of when you talk about the passionate body there's also something about the sanctified body Okay. Um, oh, by the way, um, I mentioned it last week, Eugene Monick's book on evil, uh, uh, I can't remember the other words in the title. Uh, beautiful book. Um, you know, Monick uh, published a number of books in the 80s and 90s, I guess. Well, several books in the 80s and 90s. He did write about AIDS and death in terms of the Grunewald altarpiece with unbelievably courage, unbelievable courage, and I think more clarity than a lot of people, right? He is facing the most difficult things about death and fear and suffering and doing in a way that I find just incredibly wise. Um, honestly, I think he does a better job than Edinger. I know Edinger was better at, let's say, other things, but mm -hmm. um, Edinger's main discussion of AIDS tends to go, oh, well, you know how they are. He'll treat people with AIDS as a symbol, which is, feels a little heartless at the time. I, I see his purpose, but reading his book was a little bit of a shock, mm -hmm. where Monik will actually go into the depths of it and say, yes, this is symbolic, but it's also real. Mm -hmm. And we don't get to not face it, mm -hmm. ultimately difficult thing, but I think an important thing for analysts to look at, right? So. Yeah. Hi, Paul. I'm not an analyst. I'm a music therapist, but I did, I did my MA in um, Essex in the Jungian psychology, etc. But I'm wondering, I loved, loved, loved those extracts and especially the Irish National Opera. I'm talking to you from Cork. <laughs> so, um, they do beautiful work, don't they, by the way? It's yeah, just it's gorgeous. 
Right. Really. And do you know Colin Lee and his writing about AIDS? Yes, the um, the brilliant the brilliant book. Uh, sorry, I can't remember the title. Do you remember it? I don't remember the title, but you know, I I I was around when Colin started working with gay men in the mm. 80s and you know I mean it was a real kind of uh, I was there with the fear and then he kind of took music therapy into that area you know it was just amazing his work and what he has written and done since so yeah I was just wondering did you know him here's a tricky aspect of that particular book that particular case you know, music therapy is a remarkable thing and you do it professionally, you know how wide ranging it can be. Mm -hmm. um, Lee is working with a man who is dying with, from AIDS, who is very angry, but who can play piano yeah. really, really, mm -hmm. really, really, really well and improvise. I mean, way beyond what a lot of people can do today, right? And Lee He's can match him. <laughs> absolutely and, and the cd there's a cd that comes with it it's astounding yeah. right yeah. so he yeah. can do essentially in-depth exploration existential life individuation everything that's going on he can do that in the music with amazing power most patients won't have that of course right mm -hmm. so it's an exceptional case it does show some kind of possibility for can I metaphorically transform my experience into, you know, a 20 minute piano improvisation with very, very complex style and things, almost Beethovenian, but I think not many people can do that. So it's an yes, interesting. But, but he has written a lot more and about his own experience as a gay man working um, with gay men and through music, you know, so it's not just that that was that was very uh, that's impressive. The only thing I know. Okay. Okay. Well, there is there is more. <laughs> okay. You might. I'd love it if you could send me some notes on that. That would be great to know because I'm afraid I didn't know beyond that that first book. Okay. Thank you. Well, we need to bring our talk to a conclusion. But what I want to say is the uh, the list serve is dedicated today and tomorrow to any further discussion, questions, you know, sharing of resources um, on this topic or in relation to Paul's talk on Saturday, this past Saturday. So again, I just want to thank you, Paul. And it was excellent. I was so moved. And thank you for doing this today. Thank you, everybody, yeah. for listening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. I'm going to stop recording. Paul, there's a few chat people saying so long yeah. as they move on. Yeah.